Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is December 6, 2022, and we are back for part two of our epic interview with Chanel Achenbach. Hey, Chanel. Hey. Welcome back. <laughs> Glad to be here. And of course, we are so thrilled to have Margie uh, riding shotgun. Hey, Margie. Hey there. Welcome back. Thank you, babe. So uh, if you haven't heard part one with Chanel Achenbach, pause this episode go back and watch part one. We just shared a tiny short from Chanel's interview on Facebook, and it's already got over 500,000 views, something like 5,000 likes and like 2,000 shares. Mm -hmm. So you're already taking the world by storm, Chanel. Uh Uh-oh. How does that feel? Uh, Scary. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For those who... uh, Just as a recap, or for those who are going to be obstinate and aren't going to go back and watch part one, uh, we talked about Chanel growing up in part one, growing up in San Antonio, um, joining the Mormon church as a late teenager, how, you know, her family wasn't thrilled with that idea, but she had several uh, loving Mormon individuals and families reach out to her and she joined the church immediately almost within a few years she went and served a mission right. in the south yep right <laughs> yeah and um and then ended up at in utah and we talked about her first marriage uh and how she was just kind of corralled into a marriage that she probably should have never even uh gotten into but there was a lot of utah culture and utah pressure and frankly a lot of racist um, and uh, kind of cultural expectations and microaggressions and doctrine that pushed her into a marriage that was doomed to fail. She had two children in that marriage, and that's kind of where we left off, but with a lot of important stories and context around uh, racism uh, within a Mormon context and just her experience. Would you add anything in terms of my summary of part one, Chanel? No, I think that pretty much sums it up. It was like everything that happened led to other things. Yeah. You know, gosh, 30 something years. Yeah. 30 plus years. So that's a lot. Mm-hmm. And I guess we should add um, white supremacy along with racism, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much for part one. And we're just thrilled. We're going to be talking about marriage two the kids and um, and what comes after that. But maybe the main theme for today, overriding everything, the 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 racism with and, and white supremacy within Mormonism will be a constant theme throughout. But we're also going to talk about what eventually becomes Chanel's deconstruction from her beliefs in the Mormon church. And then Margie's favorite part and what we think is one of the most important parts is Chanel's reconstruction and where she is now after deconstructing uh, her Orthodox Mormon faith. So that's what we're in for. And Jimmy Johnson's already been ordered for lunch. This is not an endorsement, (laughs) but uh, this will be, we'll probably have at least two parts to this interview and possibly a third part. But buckle in, everybody. This is a really important story. And Chanel, where should we pick up from here? I think let's just say your first marriage that should have never happened ends. Yes. And uh, where does that leave you? So you were temple married, right? No. No, you weren't temple married. That's right. You weren't temple married in that first marriage. Right. But still, there's a stigma to divorce within Mormonism. So what was it what was what was it like to have that marriage end and what was the aftermath in a Mormon in the Mormon context? What a very difficult time because first of all, you're going through a divorce. And people get it wrong. They think because you want it, initiate it, and submit for it, that it doesn't bother you. Yeah, it does. It's mm-hmm. still a death of something, whether the marriage is good or not. It's still an uncertainty and, and a religious atmosphere and culture where you're supposed to be married and multiply and replenish the earth. You just failed that. So you're already failing. You already have black things that make you, you know, you're already in trouble for that or you're already less for that. And now you got divorced. You didn't get married in the temple and now you're divorced lady. <laughs> you are not going to do well in this environment. And so it was really hard because I had to, 
I had two children. And then um, not a, I don't even know if it was on purpose or culturally or what, but after that, we had friends. We lived in like a, a little apartment neighborhood and the friends were members. And after that, things just went weird. Like we didn't hang out anymore. It was a couple, some other couples and our children um, didn't hang out anymore. They didn't know what to say to me. They didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say or do. Everyone was uncomfortable. They didn't want to ask questions, but then they did ask questions. And then they just kind of like uh, just avoid it. Like it I think it was worse avoiding me than to just say, hey, you're dumb for getting divorced. I think I could have taken that better than just avoiding me because I'm like, are they avoiding me because of me? Are they avoiding me because I'm divorced? Because before it was fine. You know, we all hung out. We talked. Even if those talks were uncomfortable, at least there was some engagement. Now it was like, here she comes, here she comes, here she comes. And I was just kind of like, I don't know what to do. So I talked to other friends who were single had never been married. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't feel like I'm getting callings now. I feel like, you know, they're not, you know, why? Is it because I'm marked because I'm divorced? Is it because they're trying to be nice and think I don't need callings because, you know, I have more responsibility as a single mom? I don't know, but everybody was weird. It was like... Okay. So that was uncomfortable. And that's got to be hard because that's kind of when you need, might need support the most. A lot. Right? Very much so. So to feel that support withdrawing right at the time you need it, that's yeah. got to be hard. Really hard because then I didn't have family here either. The church was what was their substitution for family, members of the church. Right. So. And for me, one of the most powerful parts of last episode was kind of these racist curse of Cain teachings and the pre-existence unworthiness or fence sitting associated with the curse of Cain doctrine and dark skin, you know, you learning about that and just feeling like you were never enough, but then that you had to hustle to become good enough. So then you take all that, that you should have never been carrying. And then you're pushed into a divorce that, into a marriage that never should have happened because look, we found a black guy, you know what I mean? Exactly. And then that, it only puts you even further behind in your hamster wheel hustle Absolutely. to try and become worthy. Right. Yes. Very mm -hmm. much so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I don't know. That sounds really hard. Mm -hmm. It's how do you manage that? How do you navigate that without anyone um, kind of saying, Hey, so, we're also black members. We've also been through it. And this is what you do now. There was none of that. It was yeah. just me trying to just being thrown in, in, in a water, not knowing how to swim and being told, figure it out and trying to figure that out. And then trying to think about who you are, what you're supposed to do. You're, you're already marked for, you're already starting behind. So like at the, if you're going to run a 50 yard dash, everybody else starts on the, the line, you are already back there and they're telling you, you're going to work harder, run faster they're going to start on the line. You, you get back here and start and you're like, okay, I'm in this race. And they are telling you the whole time you're starting back there, but guess what? You can do it. And if you do it, you're going to be rewarded. And you're like, yes, I can do this. And so you're already behind. Mm. And then, then they say, wait, wait, you're behind, but hold on. Let me add some other stuff. This is for your own good though. This is for your own good. So you're black and now you're divorced and you don't have family, like just keep putting you back, putting you back, putting you back, putting you back, but you can do this. And you're like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Have faith, endure to the end. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. And I'm like, okay. Hmm. Now there were no, do you, you, I know at some point we're going to talk about disciplinary councils because you mentioned that in a different Mormon stories episode. Were there any disciplinary councils involved in this first marriage or divorce? Yes. For you? Yes. Okay. I don't, I only mention that because you've mentioned it in other contexts. Correct. Is that something for us? It's we want to talk about that whenever it's possible because we feel like disciplinary councils are horrendous. It was awful, and terrible. But that doesn't mean you necessarily want to talk about it today. So I'm literally checking in with you. No pressure. You can say I don't want to talk about it today, or you can talk. About That's it. good. I think for it's our important audience. to okay. talk about. Okay. So do you want to give us some background on that? And sure. again, only share what you're comfortable sharing. Sure. Okay. So this first marriage um, was this black man that I, you know, I had met because someone said that she thought we'd be good for each other. 
And um, this is after finding out he can't get married in the temple. This is finding out that family is not going to come. His family is not going to come. My family is not going to come. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I'm not having it the way my girlfriends, they're all getting engaged, but they're getting married in temple. All their families here. So kind of frustrating. And so he was who he was. And so he kind of pressured, you know, pressured, you know, for some physical intimacy. And I was like, no, we can't do that. We're going to get in trouble. And, he, you know, he's good. You know, I was like, well, you know, it's not a big deal because we're not going to get married in temple anyway. And I was like, yeah, I understand that. So long story short, we were intimate. Okay. And this was after... This was like a week before we got married and uh, we got married and that was that. Got married at a courthouse, had our reception and um, things, things were weird for like for a minute. And then one day I went to go pick him up from work and uh, he said, I can't go home right now. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, hey, there's something going on. He worked for a church company at the time. It was ECMI. Mm. Um, and he had said that he knocked over a TV and they were holding his check and they were keeping him. And I was like, that's not right. I'm going to call the bishop. So I called the bishop. I said, hey, they're, they're not, you know, this is a church owned company. They're not treating him right. These things are going wrong. And the bishop's like, yeah, that doesn't sound right. That That's awful. Let me call. He called them and the bishop had asked me questions he said i need to ask you questions is your husband a member of the church and i said yes does he have any kids no he's like uh he is he's not a member he does have a child and i was like what mm. and so we started discussing he says is there anything else i need to know and i said well we were intimate like to me it was just like we were intimate and he's like what and i was like yeah a week before we got married and he's like what and i was like yeah, like we were already getting married. It was just a week before. And he's like, no, that's that's actually wrong. That's actually really bad. And I was like, why? We got married and it was a week before. And he was like, no, 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 no. He said, you're going to have to go for a disciplinary council. You're, you're going to have to talk about this. And we need to assess what we need to do. And I go, about what? We're married. We were married. And uh, this was after we had been married, I think, six weeks maybe six weeks mm. and so i went and it was in the culture hall it was a bishop his counselors a secretary and some other men so me alone mm. in the culture hall with like six men telling them what we did were they six white men yeah of course they were six <laughs> white men asking this black woman about her intimacy with now her husband mm. uh, they arc. asked me how what when then, you know, how many times, what the situation was, did we do it more than once? And I was like, wait, what? Like, I just told you it would happen a week before we're married and it was detailed questions and I was really uncomfortable, but you, you have to answer them. Now I would be like, it's none of your business, but at that time indoctrinated for sure. Are you comfortable saying how detailed the questions got to Very expose detailed. them, not you, right? Very detailed. Okay. They specifically asked what we did, where we did, mm -hmm. how many times we did, and if who liked what. Mm -hmm. They're very, very detailed mm -hmm. questions. And the reason for the, the details they explain, well, there's, there's, there's a difference of necking and petting is what they're explaining than other things. So we want to make sure. So when we have to assess what happens to you, rather you're disfellowship or excommunicated, we, and plus you, you've been through the temple. So we need to know in detail to know what to do about the situation to help you with your repentance. Because you had been in doubt as a missionary. I'd been in doubt. Uh -huh. okay. So this was after my mission. Yeah. And so they're like, you're an in doubt member. Things change. So we need to know in detail because, you know, necking and petting is one thing. But if you're doing other things, then you've broken your covenant. And I was like, what? But we got married. Like, I don't see. And they said, but you still broke a covenant. So we need to know what degree of, and they said also, the more times you do it, the more it shows that you're not repentant. The more times it shows that you're not sorry, that that is a habit as opposed to a one-time fail. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And all these men are looking at me. There's, there's just all looking at me and I'm just sitting there trying to explain what I did with my now spouse. Mm -hmm. That mm. was terrible, uncomfortable and Awful. It was awful. Awful. No one's been able to explain to me how the information of who enjoyed what 
has is anything relevant. to do with anything. <laughs> yeah. And can you explain that to me? Like, no. Well, <laughs> they were explaining. So if it's it's one thing if you were talked into doing something and you didn't enjoy it, then it wasn't your fault. But if you enjoyed it, then you're cool. Like it's part of your problem. What if you were talked into it but enjoyed it? Like, <laughs> Like, I don't I know. Mean, like. I'm just, I was, I was 26. So <laughs> yeah. a, a very adult woman and just like, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, okay. It, yeah. That was weird. Yeah. It was really, really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So you felt uncomfortable. Extremely uncomfortable. I, yeah. it wasn't even about being ashamed after that because to me, I was an adult woman who got married to the man. So to me, I didn't understand why it was so horrible, mm-hmm. but what was, devastating to me is talking to a group not one man a group of males watching me explain my personal intimacy with my now spouse Mm -hmm. my now husband Mm -hmm. i do it's so interesting too that this all started uh in the context of you reaching out to your bishop for help with a situation that was completely separate and so you're in this sort of almost like trust confiding, asking for help. And then he asks you just kind of on the side about kind of intimacy. And in that, in that sort of context you share, and then it kind of flips on a dime. It's really, really awful. It was really awful because I, when I realized what that meant, he says, you know, you're going to have to be this fellowship. You're not going to be excommunicated, but this fellowship. And I said, okay, what does that mean? He says, so you can't take the sacrament, you can't pay tithing, and you can't give talks. So I'm in Relief Society one day, and she hands me a slip to read a passage from uh, Gospel Principles. Mm. And I have to hand it back to her in front of everybody else. And I said, I can't. And mm. she just looks at me like, what? So she could take that as I know why, or she could take that as, oh, you're being rude. So everybody's looking at me like, what? And I can't give prayers. I can't talk in church. I don't take the sacrament. So everybody knows something's up. So everybody, you know, are looking at me. And I'm really embarrassed because I, I've already talked to these men about my intimacy. And now these women in Relief Society, or even in Sunday school, even, I've lost my calling, so they know something happened, I, and now I give the slip, a paper back, or someone, because nobody else knows, oh, can you give the prayer, and I can't, what, I can't, so then I only explained to a, a few people, because they're like, well, what do you mean, I didn't know, I couldn't tell them, or shouldn't tell them, I just said, well, I'm disfellowshipped, and they're like, what, and I was like, well, I thought everybody knew that because these men asked me about it. So I assumed it's common knowledge and they were really uncomfortable. Like, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay. but It's such a scarlet letter. Where it was now awful. Every time you go to church, you have to pat the tray. You have to literally pass it mm-hmm. on by and you're thinking in your mind. Well, some people are watching, but in your mind, you're thinking everybody's watching. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah at any moment you can get asked to say a prayer and you have to tell them no. Yeah. And you know immediately what they're going to assume. Of course. So it's this awful shaming scarlet letter. I can't believe they do this to people. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of that kind of conformity culture where where everyone is expected to follow to a T. Then you have members who are actually like looking around to see who's not kind of for those cues of like, wait, who's on the outside? Wait, who? Like, yeah. where's the danger? Where's the... And it creates this public shaming kind of event, yeah, in these in these interactions that are, mm-hmm. yeah. It's, it's That's the last thing you needed, right? It was the absolute last thing yeah. I needed. You yeah. know, just wasn't a, a promiscuous person who was just running around with a bunch of different people. And even that's my own personal business, if that's so. Mm-hmm. It was a person with a man who she was promised to marry, A week later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So that was how the marriage began, that first marriage began. Yes. Okay. And then it lasted a couple years? A couple years. Okay. Okay. Over pretty quickly. (laughs) Okay. So when that marriage ended, were bishops involved? Were church leaders involved? I had a good, I had a good bishop at the time. 
um, he was really good about counseling. Like, I think you guys could try counseling. Uh, that obviously was never going to work. Um, but attempted that and he, he was really good about, Hey, um, I don't know what else to do. I know you're getting divorced. He tried. He really did. Um, I think he was a good bishop. It was just everybody else. And then after him being released, yeah. So how in the world you're away from your entire family support system is in another state and basically feels like you joined a cult. So you're basically kind of estranged from them. You're living here in Utah. You're a person of color when everybody else is white and now you're divorced. How do you make ends meet? How do you support two young kids? And now you've got a husband that may or may not be providing support for you. How do you survive? I had really good friends at the job that I worked. I I felt, so what I did is I ended up taking a serving job because I had two kids and I needed to be able to leave the job without getting in trouble. So other jobs were requiring that you don't miss any days. You know, you can't call in, well, you have two babies, you know, they're 15 months apart. If I need to leave, I need to be able to leave. They're in daycare. And so working at a restaurant gave me that flexibility because in the job I had was extremely flexible. I'm like, you know, Brian, I got to go. I got to go. They just called from the daycare. My child just threw up. They have hand, foot, and mouth. I have to go. I can get out of that. I can, mm. you know, get my things, have somebody else take my table, and I can leave. Mm. I couldn't do that at other jobs. Mm. You would lose your job. I didn't lose my job for going to handle my business with my children. What was the restaurant? I'm just curious. It was Red Robin. Oh, fun. Where? Uh, in Layton. Okay, fun. I loved it. It was okay. good. They were very, very, they were very supportive. And it was hard too because, because they would tease me sometime because at, at for a long time I was a straight lace Mormon. And they would go have fun. They would go to Wendover. They would drink. And I was always like, so I didn't fit in the church, but I didn't really fit in with them either because I was like, oh my gosh, you can't drink. You're going to burn in hell. And so they didn't want to hear that. And, but then at church, I didn't have people I was hanging out with, but they were really good to me. Like I, I know Christmas time, I didn't ask them to do anything, but they themselves got together and thought we need to help her. You know, she's got children. Sorry. She doesn't have family here. And they just on their own, just, I remember one of them was a male and he got a card and he had a bunch of people get together and they gave me gift card to um, Sago Lily to go get a massage. And they said, we know how hard you work. I didn't ask them for anything and they were not Mormon, mm -hmm. but they were, they were good. They were like, and the, the customers there too. I worked there for a long time because the customers were good too. I had developed relationships with customers because I remember what they ordered and had it ready for them. When they'd walk up, I knew what they drank. And so it was a real I really felt that it was a, a good family. And I was like, why can't I maneuver within the church? But I can maneuver in these people that don't even like the fact that I make them feel uncomfortable judging them, you know? So, mm. yeah, weird. Mm. But it sounds like it provided a community where you felt seen. Absolutely. In a time when you really, really needed support, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of them worried. One of them was, a couple of them were really good friends. I'm talking close friends. Like, if it was 3 o'clock in the morning and I said, I need help, they came over. Like, it was that supportive. Um, you know, some of them were concerned. Like, you know, this religion is not good. Like, you know, they're not good to black people. And I'm like, yeah, but here's the thing. I'm, I'm learning, and I've been told that things get better, and I told if I endure that I'll figure it out. We don't know everything. I said the same thing. We don't know everything. We'll learn after this life what this all means. You don't understand. You're not in it. You've not had the Holy Ghost conferred upon you, so you don't know these things. So it'll be fine. Mm. You know, they're very concerned. It's also just super weird if you read the Bible and you read the story of Jesus, like it couldn't be more clear. All these men drag a woman in front of Jesus and say, hey, she's committed adultery. Stick it to her, Jesus. And like Jesus couldn't be any more clear. Yeah. He's like, who among you is without sin? Let, let him cast the first stone. And they're all embarrassed ahead. and they walk away. And that's it. Yeah. It wasn't like he didn't turn to the woman and say, hey, 
you're disfellowshipped and I'm going to stick you with a red scarlet A and now keep you from taking the sacrament and saying prayers in church. It's just like, go that way and sin no more, you know, do better. Right. So marked like, again. Huh? So marked again. But I mean, but Jesus made it clear. You just love these people. Right. Why is the, why can't the church? Why, I wonder just why the Mormon church couldn't just like see what Jesus did and do that. How they add all this other stuff that's clearly not biblical and not Christian. Well, I and have so, my theories. <laughs> what? Well, yeah, but I mean, you're getting more love and support from your colleagues at Red Robin. From your colleagues at Red Robin, you're getting love and support, and from your supposedly Christian church, and I'm not trying to bash on the church, sure. but like I'm just dumbfounded that your Red Robin colleagues are loving you and supporting you and your church leaders who are supposed to be Christian are condemning and shaming you. Yeah. I just don't know where Christ is in that. I don't either because looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, like nobody asked them to do anything. And they, according to the church, they were the evil ones because they, they went to, to clubs and they drank and they went to Wendover. So they were evil, but yet they were the ones that were mourning when I was mourning, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were the ones that love my kids. You know what I mean? Like I was overwhelmed. I didn't have my family in town. I was overwhelmed. And a couple of times, uh, one of them got into my apartment and cleaned it and, they would just do stuff like that. Nobody told them or had a manual mm -hmm. or scriptures to tell them what to do. They did it because it felt like something they needed to do. And I'm not saying that the church people throughout my years have never been helpful. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying as a whole and as a default, it was more of a shaming thing than it was love. Because with all that supposedly love came a lot of uh condemnation like okay we love you hate the what what was it love the sinner hate the sin and i was like but we all sin so what business is it of yours you know and then comes all of the well you sin because of this and if you hang around this person yeah but these people that you're saying are sinners are the only ones i feel loved by i truly feel that they care what happens to me and my kids these sinners Yeah. Yeah. The church doesn't do single people very well either. No. Yeah. Well, it's almost like, you know, at any time when you're othered for any reason where you're, it's like you can live in this little tiny box of a space and anytime anyone kind of steps out of whatever that, you know, how small that is, I feel like, uh, I mean, I think interview after interview, there are just countless times you feel uh, love taken away. It's just denied access. Access denied. You are now a threat. You are now not. Um, and it's so incredibly painful. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw that when I was talking to um, some women about um, Relief Society presidents and they were like, well, you, you wouldn't be a Relief Society president. And I was like, uh, why not? And they're like, well, you're not married. And you've been divorced and you don't. So the image that, no, not the image. She said the mold, the example has to be what we're striving for. What are we striving for? We're striving for the celestial kingdom. What does celestial kingdom have? Man and woman married with children, multiply and replenish the earth. Well, you're not doing that. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person, but you have to set, what kind of example would it be to show a single person not that single people are bad, but a single person that's divorced with two kids struggling. You have to show the model. A mom with a husband, this is what it looks like. You know, you can't strive to something if you don't show the model of what it looks like. And how'd I'm that, like, how'd that make you feel? Awful because, but they weren't understanding there was other people that were divorced and other people struggling. And that model can't relate to any of them, mm. but I can relate to them. Mm. And so that was weird. Mm. You know, I just thought, I don't know why we were talking about that. I think we were just talking about a new person going to be called and who her counselors might be. And, and I don't know why we were talking about this. Like, yeah, but you could never be a Relief Society president, not as a single person. 
And I was like, okay. And that was a discussion. So there are sometimes moments people can reflect on where uh, it's like a crack in their kind of testimony, crack in their... Um, as you were kind of living this new reality, seeing, let's say, the church system in this way, do you, at the time, so at that time, did, did it, do you, did you notice that it changed your perspective or changed on some level how you viewed, uh, the church in a way that kind of played out eventually or no, not yet? Yes, because when things, everybody will question when things change. And then you reevaluate. You're like, well, what does that mean? So, for example, being disfellowship. So now everybody knows my business, and repentance is a personal, private thing between God. Yeah, why does all the word know what my problem is? Isn't repentance supposed to be just between me and God? Why was it with several men in the culture hall? Yeah. And so that was that was disturbing and traumatic. And then to be divorced and to lose that kind of support and then to then have conversations with women that you look up to, to then say here again, you suck because of your circumstance, not because your heart isn't in the right place that you are living the gospel, that you're reading your scriptures, that you're going to the temple, you're doing all this, but you don't fit a model we've created. The model says you need to be this. This is the picture, cookie cutter of what it needs to be, and you are not that. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where does your Mormon story go from, from there? Single, divorced mom working at Red Robin. Where does it go from there? Then it goes to, I think, the most eye-opening place to where I really started questioning hard and was ready to leave. But so that's in 2000. This is in 2002. Okay. Mm. Okay. So now there is a young man that I'm spending a lot of time with, a white male that I think is great. I think he's a good person. I We go to institute together. We go to church. We, we're doing all the right things. We're not doing anything wrong. Uh, we're, we're doing the right thing. And... I think that went on for about two years. I I just thought it was great. I mean, we conversation was good. I thought chemistry was good on my part, but he made it known to me several times, kind of angrily though, which I was reading my journal and, oh man, it is painful to read, but he was annoyed. He was like, ew, like, and it was like, this is how he was. He was like, ew, like, I don't know why I would be attracted to you. I'm just not. And I was like, wait, what? And, but you're here and you're doing these things. And he's like, yeah, but uh, like, and he would say stuff like, even my family said, if I ever brought home a black girl, they would beat me. And I was like, but you're here. I'm so confused. Um, but we still hung out. We'd have these difficult conversations. We talk about black and white issues. They'd be difficult, but they were never to the point where he, I didn't think at the time he was being hurtful and harmful until I reread my journal. Man, uh, he was like, you're gross. <laughs> Your skin, th this is gross. This is not good. Um, mm. And then I remember what finally, I think, like I said, I think this went on for about two years. But finally did it as he was How getting. How can he date you for two years and say you're gross? Two well, years. this is what he told me. He says, you cannot say I'm your boyfriend. I'm like, really? What are we doing then? What What is this? Yeah. Uh, we were kissing. We were holding hands. We are doing all this stuff. But he's like, well, I, I, I'm not holding your hand. Like, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not touching that. I'm, I'm not doing that. But it was like it was like a struggle. I can see that he struggled. Like, there are people around us. They knew what was going on. We talked about it. Um, and he, it was like this this conflict. It's It was like, I don't want to misspeak, but talking to my friend, it was like a person who is told being gay is wrong, but they can't fight what they they know about themselves. So he was like, 
he he was like, no, like, I can't. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And I'm like, what's wrong? He said, this, this is not right. This is so wrong. So finally, I was kind of trying to pin him down on, okay, what, what what's going on here? Like, we're adults. I've already been married. I have two children. What's, what's going on here? And so he's like, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. So he comes over. He says, I, I, I need to talk to you. So I said, okay. He said, this is not going to work. This is wrong. And I said, what's wrong? So he reads me the scripture, 2 Nephi. I think it was 521 about um, the skin of darkness, a, a skin of blackness and mixing. He said, Chanel, this is a curse. It's not a curse on me. It's a curse on you. And what will happen is if we mix he, he didn't say Mary. He said, if we mix and we have children, then the curse is going to be on our kids and it's going to be a curse on our union. We cannot do this. The scriptures are very specific on what they say. And I was like, what? And I'll be honest. I was mad. I was like, um, I didn't all of a sudden become black. I've been black for the past two years. So what changed now? He said, well, marriage, like when, I mean, it's one thing to, mess around. And I was like, Whoa, uh, but marriage now we're affecting kids. We're affecting generations and my family's not, they wouldn't come. Would you like that? If we try to get married, my family's not coming. They're, they're not going to support this. And so we had a long discussion about it. And I told him, I said, so interesting how I prayed. I feel right about this. You said you prayed and you don't feel right about this. Is it because you're misunderstanding the scripture? He goes, don't question. He says, I have priesthood authority. I know what I'm talking about. You don't get to tell me what God wants for me. And I said, you're correct. And so I was devastated. And then so I went to the bishop. I made an appointment with the bishop. And like I said before, I, I, was, take, I was more taken back by the bishop's reaction than his even because the bishop was really angry. He, other ones I've talked to about this issue are uncomfortable. This one was angry. I went in. I said, Bishop, I've been seeing this guy for a while. And he said he can't marry me because of the scripture. And the he was sitting in the chair. It wasn't behind a desk. It was like a like a, like a chair. And I was sitting in front of him, like very close. And he was kind of like slouching, laying down kind of. And it was weird. His body language was so weird. But I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. And he's like, I mean, his face, his, he had red, like, like pink red face and he was like it's like his face I still remember how mad he was he goes he's right just cold like that he's right first of all he's a priesthood holder so you need to listen to him second of all he's correct and then he said Utah is not ready for that I said ready for what he said interracial marriage and dating no that is so wrong he is correct and I said, that doesn't make any sense to me. We're humans. Like, I don't, he said, do you not understand? I mean, he was so mad. Like, how dare you say this? This is not okay. He is right. And I left, called my home teacher, was upset and said, I need a blessing. I am not doing well. I don't know what I just heard. I don't like what I heard from him. And now the bishop. Didn't give details. I told the home teacher a little bit about what's going on, but didn't get into details. He said, sure. He came over. He gave me a blessing. I was visibly upset, was crying, was upset. I think for about two weeks, it was really difficult. I talked to my friend about it, talked to all my other friends, and I'm like, I can't believe the bishop said that. And they, they, they were just kind of shrugging. They didn't give any kind of support either way. They didn't say the bishop is wrong. They didn't say the bishop right. They just kind of was like, yeah, that sucks. Hmm. And I'm like, that was awful. Like, but you're telling me I need to get married. I need to get married in temple. I need to be in the celestial kingdom. This young man was temple worthy. We could have been married in the temple, unlike the one before. So, um, yeah, I took that really hard. I, I think that was like a huge, huge, huge um, step to where I was like, I need to really question this doesn't feel right. This does not feel right. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And there's a part of me thinking, 
how in the world would you even give time to somebody so disrespectful? And that goes to the man you were dating for two years, but it also goes to the church. How could you give the church any time if it's teaching such racist things? But then I think about the fact you're in Utah, surrounded by white people. Um, you're, you've been cut, uh, cut off, in effect, from your family and your support system. And you've been taught, oh, yeah, you're lesser than. Like you, you told in the last episode, you were warned. You, you're you're going to have a hard time, and it's going to be your job in this church to be resilient, to be strong, because adversity is going to be baked into this ex experience for you. So you were almost like primed, primed and groomed mm -hmm. to withstand constant abuse by individuals and by the institution and 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 told you were lesser than from the start and that you just need to hustle to become equal to everybody else and uh, so of course you were willing to endure endless abuse cuz cuz you were part of an abusive system that groomed you to be okay with the abuse you have to trust the majority you're looking at all these couples that are married and they seem to be doing well. Why would they be lying? And you're just one black person. Yeah, it has to be you. So it has to be me. That's misunderstanding. So then the gymnastics start, you start making it work. Well, why are they wrong? Why is he wrong? It's right there in the scriptures. Are the scriptures wrong? So then they do this. They tell you, Chanel, you have to decide if the scriptures are true or not. And if the scriptures are true, everything else is true. So then I decide, do I believe the Book of Mormon is true? And I'm like, well, I don't think it's untrue, right? It can't be untrue, right? Because I've had good feelings. Those good feelings were true, but they weren't of the church. They were of the people. But you're in your mind but those feelings were good. Remember the day you got baptized? It wasn't because I was thinking about Jesus. It was because when I came out of the water, there was 30 people I'd never seen in my life cheering for me. You know? So how am I not going to feel good about that? I have people who I value or people that seem that they're way better than I could ever be saying I did a good thing. I'm going to make it work. You know? And so you read that scripture and then they would say something like Chanel. They'd use the pie analogy, which is funny because they use a pie analogy for other stuff too. But they would say, okay, so they talked to me about my favorite pie. And at that time I told them coconut cream pie from Marie Callender's. And they'd say, okay, so think about this pie. So if you have one sliver of that pie that's bad, you're really going to throw away the whole pie? No, you're not. You're going to take that bad part out. You're going to either throw it away or just don't eat it. But you're going to eat the rest of the pie because it's good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's true. So this racist part of this scripture is just a few scriptures. It's not the whole Book of Mormon. The rest of the Book of Mormon is good, right? Yeah. And you chose this trial, right? Yeah. And this is what God wants, right? You're going to question God? No. You're going to question a priesthood holder that has a direct link to God? Hell no. It's me. I'm supposed to go through this. It is my fault. I chose this in the preexistence. Okay, I'm good. I don't like it. It's good. Okay, next. I'll, I'll, I'm over it. Okay, I understand. I wrote that down in my journal. Yeah, so much emotional manipulation there. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. But it sounds good. It, it fits so good, though. And these, to be clear, were white people telling you what the pie was and that racism was one slice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a small part. Mm -hmm. You're making it a bigger deal than it needs to be. Okay, sorry. Mm. Right. And, and you mentioned kind of our LGBT brothers and sisters. There's this idea of internalized homophobia where you hate the gay part about you, even though you're gay. Mm -hmm. I from the studies I've done with, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King and others, if you grow up in a society where white is perceived as supreme, you can grow up hating your blackness, even if you're black. Not, not hating it, but also kind of hating it. 
definitely mad at yourself that why would you choose this trial? And why didn't John choose this trial? What was I thinking? Did I really want this? Yeah, you did. Because you know what, Chanel? You know what you're getting in the afterlife. You know that you're sure in. The harder the trial and the better you endure it, you think you're not going to get gold in the afterlife? It's not going to be here. That's fine. But you know that after you die, you're going to be like the first. You'll probably sit on the right hand next to Jesus. I will. Yeah, because I endured harder than you. I chose this trial. Okay, yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah, okay, cool. That's what I thought. My, I'm 18, I'm 20, I'm 26. Everybody's telling me these things. Okay, everybody's a big word. Most people are telling me these things because I'm telling them I'm uncomfortable. I don't like this. I, I don't like the racism. But you chose to be the trial. And you have to understand it was what you and your people did in the pre-existence that brought this trial. I didn't think to question, but we said people are punished for their own sins, not for Adam's transgression. So why would I be punished for something in the pre-existence that didn't click until now? Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And that whole in the afterlife, it'll be great. Just primes Couldn't you wait. to endure a miserable life now. Exactly. But Jesus Christ endured a miserable life and he was a son of God. You know, mm -hmm. Sister Baker, he got nailed on the cross. His own people did stuff to him. Why do you think you're any better than Job? Why do you think you're any better than Jesus Christ that you don't have to go through these trials? Who are you? Yeah, you're right. If Jesus can do it and Job can do it, yeah, and Alma went through it and Abinadi and all these people went through that. Oh my gosh, and Nephi, he had it from his own brothers. Who am I to question? I, I bought into it heavily. Mm. I just wanted to do good. You know, if you talk to my family, I have, um, I say exactly what I think, but I didn't do bad things. Like I've never been arrested. I don't, I don't like getting in trouble. So if you said God said it, I'm not questioning it. Mm -hmm. That was my thought process then. Yeah. Which kind of brings back that element of safety, trying to keep yourself safe, right? Right. Mm. I'm so sorry. So how did things end with this man you were dating? So I divorced him. He got papers. He didn't. Oh, no, no, no. The, oh. the, the man oh. you were dating. Man, it was so weird because we were really good friends, though. So that made it really difficult. He was racist. He'll admit it. He was racist very much. But from where he was from, it's understandably why. And plus, he would remind me that his siblings were older and they were they were the age of my parents. So he was very young. You know, he was he was younger than me. And so that was how he was raised. So after that, it was tense for a minute. But then we remained friends. And then I started dating somebody else after a while. Um and I remember a couple of times he said he thinks he made a mistake, you know, but then it, it was what it was. And uh, we still remain good friends. And then um, I got married to my second husband and he knew about it. And he it was weird because he was white. correct? He was white. So that. OK. So the second husband's family were all members. Mm hmm. Oh my goodness. He was not, he was, um, it was his aunt, his cousins, his grandparents. Um, they were all members and active. He was not. So the fact that he was willing to marry you, a, a black woman was in part because he wasn't a believing Mormon. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that he told me up front. He's like, um, listen, they're not going to go for this. They are racist. And I'm like, no, they're not. And he's like, yeah, they are. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're polite and nice to me. He goes, yeah, to your face. And I was like, okay, okay. And I don't think, I don't mm. think people understand what racism is. There's white supremacy, there's prejudice, and there's racism. Racism, if you just look at me and all these thoughts come in your head about what you think I am based on not even knowing me and based on my skin color, that's racist. If you think... 
I'm on welfare by looking at my skin, that's racist. If you think that I eat a certain way based on my skin and you don't know me personally, that's racist. If you think that I'm trying to trap your nephew into getting pregnant to hold on to a white man because it's better based on my skin, that's racist. So yes, they were racist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then white supremacy is what? White supremacy is when you believe that your race is superior and that people need to suffer under your heels because of that. That you think that not only are you better, but that they are inherent, inherently evil or bad. And that you start making policies, laws, um, systems, right? systems to oppress them because of what you think they do, capable of doing, and so forth. It's, it's intent. Racism, racism is, is, is part of it. Racism, I think racist can be taught because racist doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means you might be ignorant of things. It means you're not open. It means that you could be incorrigible and clueless. Uh, but white supremacy, you are incorrigible. You cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. You cannot be taught that what you're thinking and what you believe needs to happen. Um, when they say stuff like black on black crime, that is the most ridiculous thing I, I've ever heard <laughs> because I'm in Utah and there's crime being committed all the time and they're not black, but black on black crime. You never justifies. hear in Utah white on white. No, crime, it right? justifies their actions. In Utah it's just crime because it's, it's just crime. mostly white people committing crimes <laughs> against mostly white people. So you'd never hear ever white on white crime. Or Mormon on Mormon crime. <laughs> right. I'm just like, yeah, exactly. that is the most ridiculous thing. Once, ever, right? Yeah. So, so if a black person happens to commit a crime against a black person, we're going to call that out. It's, for sure. it's black on black crime, That's not what, uh, yeah. proximity that they're all living together. <laughs> so it's like, if, if I live with my siblings and I'm fighting with my siblings, it's, black it's because they yeah. live with me, yeah. not because they're right. my siblings. Yeah. Okay. They're getting on my nerves. <laughs> So like j just because we're talking about it, like I think more for some reason Mormons and probably lots of white people, they're okay with the idea that white people can be racist sometimes. But if you bring in the term white supremacy, it's like, oh no, 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 wait a minute. That's the KKK. That means you have white robes and you're like lynching people. Like white supremacy That's is going too think. far. But then you look at Mormon doctrine and you look at Mormon practices. If we define white supremacy as a, a a race, and we know race is a problematic construct to begin with, but mm -hmm. people that think of them, a, a, a group of people with a certain skin color, if we call white supremacy a group of people with a certain skin color thinking they're superior to another group with a different skin color, if we call that white supremacy, that's Mormonism. Absolutely. That's, that's in the Book of Mormon. It's in the Book of Moses. It's in the Book of Abraham. And every single prophet, seer, and revelator prior to 1978 taught it. That, that people with dark skin color made mistakes and were punished as a result, whereas white people didn't, didn't experience the same punishments. That's definitionally white supremacy. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think what they don't understand is the sources that I have are their own church leaders and the books that I read I refuse to read anti-Mormon literature. What is anti-Mormon? Something that people are using to try to say, to, to make up lies. The books I read, like Mormonism and White Supremacy, it is Joanna Brooks. She loves the church. She's an active Mormon. So uh, if she's saying it and she is showing pictures and doc documents and who said what when to, to bring this out, she has a whole book on this. And she likes the church. Then you have John Lund. He was a, a professor at BYU. He taught that. He liked the church too. You've got Jesse, uh, Jesse Embry, also a member of the church that loves the church. Black saints in a white church. They bring that up because they're saying it's an issue. So if we can't talk about it, and acknowledge it. We can't fix it. So when people keep saying that was just a long time ago, that was, and it was Brigham Young. Why are you only blame, blaming Brigham Young? Let's be honest here. Joseph Smith was just as bad. Okay. Or just not. Okay. 
Let me rephrase. He wasn't just as bad, but he was part of it too. And he had his own beliefs about that. There are discourses that are printed with his words on what he believed. Then you go prophet after prophet after prophet explaining what they think about black people. Okay. So let's say that members avoided that. They really lived in the bubble and they had no clue. I joined the church in what, 1990? Who was the prophet then? Ezra Taft Benson. Do we really want to talk about him? Ezra Taft Benson was part of what, John Birch Society? What is that about? He didn't believe in civil rights. He said that fighting for civil rights was communism. Well, okay, let's say that it stopped at him and no more about racism was talked about. They Going forward, they never taught anything racist, but they didn't unteach. So if you taught, let's just say only 100 members believe what Ezra Taft Benson and other prophets taught about black people. You never unteach taught it and even let's say bruce almond conkey they're like oh that was his own ideas but you let him say it you can't excuse that right now how do you think it would go over if in sunday school they started teaching that they want all their kids to um not marry the same sex i mean that they want their kids to marry the same sex how do you think that would go well they would say something because they don't agree with that they let things be taught that they agree with. So Bruce Alman Kanki was terrible, and that was just one prophet's idea, but you let him teach it at a podium. You let him write about it. You never said, stop that. Do not write that, because you supported it. So then you come later and you disavow. Disavow means what? That, hey, I don't know, but I want no part of that. Disavow does nothing. It just makes people research deeper the racism and white supremacy within the Mormon church. You could take that for whatever you want. You could either say, hey, I can see the problem. I want to acknowledge and do something. Or you can say it doesn't exist, but it does. And there's so much proof. That's what makes it look bad. So then what happens now, the only way they combat this and make it right, they're going to have to apologize. So Mormon church, if you want me to shut up, first of all, you're going to have to apologize to me and everybody else. That is a demand. You're going to have to apologize. Number two, you're going to have to unteach that, meaning actively teach anti-racism. You're going to have to say, hey, we are human. We got it wrong. We messed up. We have no problems with inner marriage. We have no problem with black people. That stuff that in the pre-existence is wrong. It is not true. It wasn't of God. We made mistakes. Now, what racism looks like is X, Y, Z, what it looks like in our church buildings, what it looks like in our homes is X, Y, Z. We're not doing that because our brothers and sisters are important. Then I stop talking. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you have to teach us this. Yeah. But thank you for teaching us. Of course. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking and saying, you know, hey, look at all these resources, Joanna Brooks, or and all these kind of within the church, it it's also, um, it's also like hear my experience, like right. it matters, you know, and this idea of privilege, right? That the more privilege, if you're in a group, you know, the the people with the most privilege should not be the ones talking. Right. It's this idea of you should be listening to people who have less privilege as they talk about their experience as opposed to like, well, that's just not my experience or, you know, and so your experience matters, you know, your voice matters. And um, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that in the times that you were trying to use your voice or share, you know, parts of yourself, you know, that it's kind of like uh, you weren't listened to. It just it didn't matter. Well, I, I understand as I think about it and I manage conversations with people, what happens is just recently, uh, my dear friend, I hope that she's watching because I want her to understand how painful this was. So this is a person that wasn't considered my friend. This person was considered family. This is how we talk to each other. Hey, sis, we're sisters. And um, I was telling her about some of the concerns I was having as I was learning for sure about racism and white supremacy in the church. We were talking, she's like, well, let me call you. So she calls me and she's saying, hey, um, that's not true. There's nothing about the church that's racist, much less white supremacy. I said, sure there is. 
And I'm like, you don't know about, she said, the church never taught that. That is not true. That, that I don't know what those documents are. I don't know what that is. So then she gets him on the phone. I had to be careful with who him is. And he's like, no, I think what happened is there's a couple of people that are racist, but the church as a group, as a whole, isn't. And I'm like, so you really want to go with that? Very much so. Because you've seen it. It's it's here. It is in the document. It's not even just documents. These men, church leaders, made quotes with their whole chest saying the skin and the curse of the black men, the Negro, this, and they are not, oh gosh, just, I'm thinking just the different church leaders over the years that have made comments about black people and, 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 and so definitive. It wasn't like, Hey, I think black people might be cursed. I think it was like they are deal with it. They made choices in the preexistence deal with it. And members don't you dare mix with them. Cause if you mix with them, you're going to die on spot. Your kids will be killed on spot. This was taught to people. And this is a dear friend of yours. You were making this the point. Is this a is someone. dear friend of mine who was like, nope, mm -mm, nope. And then I thought, okay, so why is she struggling to accept this information? Well, first of all, if you acknowledge it and admit it, what do you have to do when you know something? You have to act. And if you have to act, what does that look like? Does that mean you question the church what they're telling you not to do? Do you leave the church? No, you can't do that because of community and your family and what you have in your head about, you know, visiting. You have callings, you have prestige, you have this. If you admit this, well, what does that say about your church? That it may not be true. So you have all of these different things that transpire as you admit something. If I, if my kids, if I have to admit something about my kids that they tell me, mom, I think you were a little too uh, angry the other day. I'd be like, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Or I can say, yeah, I was. And then what does that look like? Now I have to acknowledge my behavior. Now I have to do the work to change my behavior. And then I have to apologize and manage that relationship with them so that it doesn't happen again. People aren't willing to do that. They like their comfort. Well, it didn't happen to me. So not only are they having attitudes of, well, it didn't happen to me. Well, I don't want it to happen to me. I see how you treat, you're treated. I don't want them coming after me. So I'm sorry, you, you deal with it. I'm not saying it didn't happen or it's not true. I just don't want it to happen to me. So good luck with that. I got a lot of that. Yeah. So it feels like guys, gaslighting. Is that gaslighting yeah. to be like, no, you that, that actually hasn't happened to you or no, your experience really wasn't that way. Yeah. Like I just Googled like, <laughs> you know, statements by Mormon leaders about race. You know what I mean? Oh gosh. <clears throat> you know, Sick. and of course, you know, there's, there's Brigham Young quotes. Um, you know, Brigham Young will say, and I'm just like, this is one of like 50, you know, you must not think from what I say that I am opposed to slavery. No, the Negro is damned and is to serve his master till God chooses to remove the curse of ham. You know, okay. that's, that's yeah. Brigham Young. You know, but but it, that's just one of really many, many, many awful things. But you can go all the way up to the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, Joseph Fielding Smith saying, who was a prophet of the Mormon church in the 70s, right? While I was alive, right? Not only, you know, was Cain called to suffer, but because of his wickedness, he became the father of an inferior race. A curse was placed upon him, and that curse has been continued through his lineage and must do so while time endures. They have been made to feel their inferiority and have been separated from the rest of mankind from the beginning. And again, just Google <laughs> like Mormon leader racist quotes, and you'll find hundreds that are horrific. And, and so when a white woman tells you that Mormon church leaders have never taught racist things, it's gaslighting and it's just like objectively false and super <laughs> insulting. And I'm so sorry. Well, not only that, she also was like, you really need to not speak out on this because you're going to ruin people's lives. My life is, is pretty hard, hun. 
because of the things that people are saying and being taught. Mm. You, you have to understand you have a bowl and you're pouring things into this bowl. Everything that you poured into it is what it contains, even if it's good. Was there love? Sure. Was there friendship? Sure. Was there hate? Yes. Was there gaslighting? Yes. Was there harm? Yes. Was there racism? Yes. Was there white supremacy? Yes. Did they help bring beautiful gifts on Christmas? Yes. That doesn't change racism. It doesn't change white supremacy. It doesn't change. Could you imagine having conversation after conversation with people that you love about race when they said they don't want to talk about race, but they don't want to keep bringing it up um, about um, stuff like, I, I think the most um, iconic, powerful, horrible time was 2016. That's when I was like, okay, I'm done. There's no way. There's no way I can. I said, God, if you are real and I have to endure this, then I'd rather go to hell. Okay, what time period are you talking about? Now 2016. That's when I was like, I'm done. Okay, wait. So I, I just want to make sure we don't lose the story. So you marry the second husband who was not a member when you married him? He's not a member ever. Yeah, he... He never joined? No. Okay, and so you didn't marry him in the temple either? No. But you found someone to help share life with? Sure. Had had two children with uh, yes. him? And you two <clears throat> were married for how long? We were married for 16 years. And did you stay active in the church during those 16 yes. years? He was good about it, but you know what? I'm going to tell you something about him that was really good. He, a lot of times, we would have conversations where he legitimately seemed scared and he would say, Chanel, you got to get out of this church. As opposed to the first one was like, no, everything's great. We're fine. He was always like, it was like, this is an exaggeration, but it was like him looking over his shoulder like, okay, you need to get out of here. You are not okay. You need to get out of this. I'm telling you, I know my family. Get out. Don't you cannot stay in this Chanel. I'm telling you, get Mm -hmm. your children out of this. And I said, no, well, you know, I, I struggled this month because, you know, both kids had hand, foot and mouth and I missed a month of work. So they helped me with Bishop storehouse. I'm not going anywhere. And he's like, you're being bought. And I go, no, they're helping because I've paid tithing. No, you're being bought. And so he was just like, you know, I'm telling you, this will not end good. This is not good. He's like, I've been around this my whole life. I am telling you, get out. And, and at that at that point, what did you feel when he would say those things to you? Was it reassuring? Because you felt like actually some of those experiences that you felt like he was actually seeing a reality that you're like, yeah, actually, that is part of my reality. Or was it disturbing to you? Was it confusing because you felt split? Like, how did it feel when he would say those things to you? I guess he wasn't a member, so he didn't have authority in your eyes. Correct. As a non-member. Is that Correct. part of it? Part of it was... I knew what he was saying was true, but I felt because I had one or two people that were kind and got it, that was enough. And I can make it better because they're going to see how great I am and they're going to see how well I endured despite the circumstances. Oh, they're going to love me. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to know my scriptures. I'm going to know this. I'm going to read my scriptures every day. They read the Book of Mormon once in a year. I've read it three times in a year. So they're going to really know that I'm in it. So because I'm in it, now they're going to light, they're going to, you know, let up on me. They're not going to make me feel as cursed or as messed up. And they're going to see that even though I chose that in the preexistent and then I'm cursed, that curse is not defining me because look, Look how good of a member I am. Mm -hmm. I like swearing, but I didn't swear then. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't watch rated R movies. I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to. I like coffee. I grew up with my mom drinking coffee. I stopped doing it because they said if I did, I would burn. I didn't want to burn. So things that I liked that I really didn't think were awful, I had to trust the people around me whose lives seemed good. I had to believe what they were saying. So I had to endure it, even though I believed him. He wasn't trying to hurt me. He was like warning me. He's like, Chanel, I'm telling you, this is not good. Yeah, but what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? My family is where? I don't know how to relate to Mm -hmm. anybody but Mormons. 
my friends who were non-Mormons, they weren't having it. Who am I going to talk to now? If I leave, what, what will I do? Who will I talk to? So I'll make it work. I will make it work. Just like I'm making it work with you in this marriage. I will make it work. Because hmm. going back, after you had that boyfriend between your first and second marriage, boyfriend, I say in quotes, dump you with really racist justifications. You said you almost left the church then. Oh, yeah. But it sounds like even though you married as your second husband, a non-Mormon, something something pushed you to, to keep going. Mm -hmm. Friend, what do you, don't you dare, Chanel. You're just listening to apostate. You're just listening to the wrong people. You know, you're just upset. Right now you're just upset. And because you're upset, you're not thinking clearly. And when you're upset, that breeds contention, contentions of the devil. You've lost the Holy Ghost. So you have to do the part and the work to get the Holy Ghost back so you can make better decisions. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So. So it's so many conversions are social. Right. And so many people stay in the church yeah. for social or familial reasons that we we conflate with with the spirit because I always say the Holy Ghost feels a lot like social approval. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and you know what? The adversary feels a lot like social rejection. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I had to learn to maneuver through this. And I, I, I finally realized, you know what? When do you get the most support and a pat on your back? Because remember, I'm needing to feel secure and that I'm, that I'm great, not great, that I'm a good person and that I'm capable of having good lives. But how do I do that if I'm divorced, if I'm not financially uh, savvy, I struggle as a single mom, how do I win their support? <gasps> That's how, when I give good talks, they love and support me. When I give good talks, that's when they talk to me. When I give eloquent prayers, that's when they talk to me. If I'm emotional about a scripture that they like and get emotional about, they relate to me. Oh, okay. So I got it. That's what I need to do. If I tell them what they want to hear, that they're the most spiritual people I've ever seen and that their talk was the most amazing thing, that I was so moved that I thought it was going to be translated, they listen to me. But if I ask them questions, they don't want to have anything to do with me. Mm. Got it. That's what I need to do. I'm thinking of this moment in, in the Malcolm X book slash movie when, when Malcolm X learns that if he if he, you know, when he's shining the shoes, if he behaves a certain way, he gets the tip and he gets the pat on the back. You know, I, I don't know if he, I think you mentioned oh, yeah. the term shuck and jive or something, yes. but like, it's almost like the race or the group of people in power train the people who aren't in power how to behave. And the church want the, I can imagine a bunch of white Mormons feeling uncomfortable about our racist past and present. But if we can have some people of color around, if we can influence them to stick around and occasionally give a good prayer or occasionally give a good talk or pay, occasionally appear in a church video saying, hey, I'm black and the church treats me great, you can kind of pat them on the head, show them a little bit of attention, yep. and the function they serve in society is to make in the Mormon society is to help us all feel a little bit better Absolutely. about our racist past and present. And if we have to, you know, make you feel horrible, put you in a disadvantaged position and then throw you a little welfare every once in a while or help you with a utility payment or whatever, I guess that's a small price to pay for your existence being there to help us feel a lot better about all our problems and our mistreatment of a whole group of people. I don't Absolutely. know if it hurts or is uncomfortable for me to be saying it that clearly, but that's just how I'm processing what I'm hearing. But that's the truth because the thing about conversations I have with people where I'm like, hey, Brian, um, there's some stuff that happened in the church that I have a question about, something that happened years ago and stuff that's happening now. Can, can I talk to you about it? Oh, sure, of course. Well, you know, when 
They said this in the Book of Mormon about the race. Oh, shut down. Automatic body change. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, uh, sister, stop. Because that is headed to apostasy and that is contention of the devil. I'm feeling uncomfortable and contentious. You can't do that. That is not of God. That's the Holy Ghost is not here. And I'm like, I I brought in a bad spirit. Yeah. You the, for asking a sincere yeah, question. Like, don't don't do that. That's mm. so messed up. And by the way, you need to understand something. Um, Africa is growing. And the I'm church. Like, the yeah. church in Africa. They're like, the church in Africa is growing. I'm like, wait, what what does that have to do with me? Like, <laughs> what? And I said, but they're not growing for what you're teaching them. You are <laughs> right. throwing things at them. I know what's going Because we're not teaching on. them about the racism. No, right? you're, you're, you're not. So your discussions aren't, hey, so Brian, here's, here's the thing. So we have a history. We have some stuff we're working on with racism. And you're going to encounter that with members and non-members. But the church is true. Oh, okay. No, in, no informed consent. We're not having those conversations with not the African at all. converts. Nope. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this may seem obvious, but like this idea too of um, there's like a layering that goes on. I think if we're going to talk about conditioning as white people and Mormonism is a layer, but I also think it's important to kind of nest it as an American religion too. Mm -hmm. Like it was started in America oh, yeah. Yeah. and America has Not its own problem. <laughs> problems, oh, seeing yeah. its history, apologizing, accountability, yeah. how to repair, yeah. how to like make amends and actually yeah. make things right. So like there's so many layers here um, that, you know, as white people acknowledging, you know, this idea of Mormon Mormonism isn't racist or, and therefore your experience, it's like, there's, there's just so much there. <laughs> Cause it's like, yeah, you're walking with layers and layers of conditioning as in white supremacy as white people. It's like literally the water we swim in, um, you know, that there are many, many sources of conditioning going on here. Yeah. And Margie, on the one hand, I totally agree with you. Obviously, there are many, many racist churches in America, sure. not just the Mormon church. Of course. But I'm reminded by my Christian friends that the curse of Cain does not appear in the Bible. The curse of Cain does not appear in the New Testament. Nope. Um, Cain gets a mark in the Old Testament, but it says nothing about skin color or any any curse related to skin color that then gets passed down generationally, that's all stuff that gets added later. But it's Joseph Smith that ties the curse of Cain to skin color and then writes it into the Book of Mormon in the Lamanite narrative and into the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. It's in, so like, yes, yes, Mormons aren't the only racist church, but we are the only Christian church with explicitly racist scripture. Yes. Yeah, I totally hear that. I totally hear that. My point was just kind of in saying Mormonism is a nest of racist ideology <laughs> that sits on a foundation of racist ideology <laughs> yeah. in America. That's all. Yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. kind of saying. But we kind your... of take it to 11. Like <laughs> there's traditional, that's a, that's a Spinal Tap reference, but it's like this, this amplifier goes to 11. It's really loud. It goes to 11. So that's, sorry, it's a spinal tap reference. That was huge. Mormonism takes, in some ways, Mormonism takes racism to 11. It just blows. Because I don't, people hear racism and they automatically think, she's saying that I'm a bad, horrible person and that I'm evil and I beat black people and I string them up. And no, mm. you do worse. Because you don't even know. And when I try to tell you what it looks like, you don't want to hear it. For example, uh, I had a friend. I was, I was, she was like, well, well, why are you leaving the church? Like, I've seen stuff that you've said and what's going on. So we went back and forth and um, she says, okay, well, let me explain. Her exact words. In the beginning, God cursed the evil people with black skin. Mm -hmm. But that is to protect them 
That is also to help us white people to learn to love better because we're going to see that there's a mark and we're going to want to judge and be mean, but it's teaching us how to love despite what we see. Oh, okay. So let me, let me, let me tell you what I'm hearing. I'm hearing you say that God cursed me with black skin to make you a better person, a better lover of people. Got it. Happy to oblige. You know, uh, I was like, are you being serious? Oh, doy I too. Yes. It's to help love you better. And we are getting good at it. The hell you are. No, you're not. Mm. Okay, can I ask you, um, I'm curious if I can ask you uh, about the end I feel like of the last interview, you touched on a really powerful, I feel like important um, thread of your experience. And you kind of talked a little bit about white women in particular in your experience being exceptionally damaging, hurtful, betraying. Do you want to, do you feel comfortable speaking a bit about that now? Yes. Wow. Like I am, and, and maybe her, to her point, maybe they all believe this because she said it's to help us love you better. So I think about these experiences that I've had with white women and white let's, Mormon women, white mostly. Mormon women, not, not white women outside the church, white Mormon women. And this is the same feel. I think I've, I've even had instances with them in MLMs and what they would say to me and what they would think. Uh, one told me that I would do better if I was, what was it? Do what, do what I was told. That I would, I would do better in this MLM if I would just do what I was told. Even though it was supposed to be my own business. I still need to do what I was told by the white people. And the, the, the friendships and the relationships with the white Mormon women, it's, it's the age of probably 30 to about my age, 50. Those are the people I'm interacting with. And it's like kind of... Karen's like, like I have no choice in my life, no decisions to make. You need to do this. You need to do it like this and like that. Do you see how I did it? And I'm like, what? This is how they talk to me. And, ah, uh, my husband can attest to this. As we started dating, he started meeting my girlfriend. Um, you need to do it this way. No, no, no. You cannot watch that. Nope. You went to a club with your friend. You cannot do that. You cannot do this. That, 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 that is how they talk to me. They talked down to me and scolded me. And if I didn't do it the way that they said, then the friendship was strained. I had one tell me we were, we're getting into it kind of hot and heavy because she started with the black on black crime. She's like, the reason why you guys have problems is because you don't know how to behave. You're not good people. Look at your communities. I was like, really? And she's like, yeah. And she says, and the reason why your life is the way it is is because you make really bad choices. You make horrible choices. So you're getting what you deserve. And I was like, oh, okay. And I said, so what I'm hearing is that you think you're better than me. She said, yes, obviously. She said, I am way better than you. I live the gospel. Look at my life. Look at yours. How many times have you been married? That's because you're a bad person. But I love you. Okay, lady, you just punched me in the face and now said you love me. I don't want that kind of love. Mm. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, just how they talk like that. So in consistently misunderstanding what I'm saying to them and then coming at me, I mean, some of these things are public on Facebook. Um, I mean, one, all I said was that I loved her. I loved her so much. In fact, I loved her so much. My daughter and I went to her house and we told her, we have not felt such a good feeling. And, and my, my daughter, still kind of like religious, said she described it as like the spirit. She said, Mom, I felt such a good spirit in her house. Me, I was kind of like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that spirit and God stuff right now. But she was right. I don't sleep very well. I suffer immensely with insomnia. But when I was at her house, I was like getting tired because I felt comfortable. And so... 
she w- she says some pretty racist things and she says some pretty ignorant, clueless things. I meant her well. I was trying to help her. I didn't want people seen because people on the side were telling me things about her. Like people that she thinks are her friends are actually telling me, uh, we don't agree with her, but we're not going to start anything. Uh, she's wrong. And so I worried for her. I really loved her. And so one day I called her clueless. I said, that is clueless. You're clueless. I meant it. I'm clueless of a lot of things. I didn't think clueless was a bad word. She lost it. I mean, she just went crazy, started insulting me and saying, you're a terrible person. You're not my friend. You're not this. You're not that. Well, a lot of times I would, something she would post, I would put it in uh, the form with my friends and we would discuss it. And I, I was trying to, so she said, your triggers are your problem. She posted something where it says, um, people that have triggers, your triggers are your problem. So I called her on it. Your triggers are your problem. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to tell you those things are not good. You like to try to tell me about my behavior to help me. I do care about you. This is not smart lady. This is not, this is racist. This is not good. Yeah. Just to be clear, the stuff you're calling her clueless about are opinions that she's publicly sharing. Correct. About black people. About black people, about LGBTQ. I mean, she mm. is just like not getting it. So bigotry. She's basically saying bigoted things. Really about blatant about ones. black people and LGBT people publicly on the internet. So when you say you're being clueless, you're basically saying you don't understand what you're talking about, about yeah. these persecuted minorities. You're Correct. trying to help her. I meant very much so. The way she talked, I matched how she talks. So if I said to her, hey, Becky, listen, this is not okay. That's not how she works. That's not how she talks to people. So why would I think that would work? So I talked to her confidently mm. as what I thought confidently mm. and said, she talks, this is how you talk. Uh, with an air of, an, of authority, yeah. I bet. She I, dishes it out. And, and she says she can handle it. And for the most part, she does. She was like, you're right. And she had been receptive many times. So you know what? You're right. I, I got that wrong. So I thought our relationship was enough to where I can say, hey, direct. Uh, you're getting it wrong. That's clueless. She lost it, just lost it. And then was like, mm, 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 mm. well, let me tell you something about you and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I said, honey, take a step back. Hold on a second. Reread what I wrote. Reread what I said. Mm-hmm. I said, this is coming from a good place. Uh, I said, you're clueless. You are clueless. I am clueless about this, this, this is not. It didn't mean harm. Maybe I can choose a better word, but you don't know. You're not in these spaces. You can't understand. And you are harming people by the things that you're saying. I mean, they had, they posted these horrible, horrible um, memes and quotes about Kamala, Kamala Harris. And I was like, you keep insulting black woman, women. I'm a black woman. Mm-hmm. I see your post. Mm-hmm. And she didn't take that well. That's also like boundary, by the way, which is brilliant. But it's like, I love this idea of like, you know, giving her feedback, direct feedback. And you have every right to protect yourself in those situations, you know, because she's doing harm and you're in relationship with her to to say absolutely not. Like right now, this is causing harm. You are not seeing that you are causing me, your like friend or supposed friend, harm with the things that you're saying so i i just you know i have to be careful about how i talk about this but because we're talking about it i want to just address one quick thing you know um so there's there's politics which is like oh i like republican policies i like conservative policies or i'm democrat i like liberal policies and that reasonable people can have reasonable points of view about policy on either side this is a nonpartisan show period okay yes. there was a level of animosity that i saw towards barack and michelle obama yes and that i saw that i see about kamala harris setting aside barack obama's politics correct setting aside kamala's politics correct. i before barack obama I never heard anyone refer to a president as the devil, yeah. as Satan. Somehow that crept into the acceptable political discourse once Obama became president, where all of a sudden it was okay to call a president the devil. Literally. And and again, 
I, you know, I know that Kamala Harris has a personality just like Hillary Clinton as a strong woman. Sure. <laughs> and we could talk about misogyny after we talk about racism. Like, I understand why a strong woman being vocal rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Sure. But, but the level of animosity that sometimes is leveled towards black political figures is people, people can hide racism in a cloak of political partisanship. And it's, it's troubling when you see it happen well, uh, for me. And I imagine it's probably more troubling for you. Like you said, politics aside, we're not talking about politics. We're talking about the people that are in politics. And this is what you have to understand as I read my journal. Um, so for a long time, people would compliment me and say, your hair looks nice. You look pretty. And I would lose it. I would start sobbing. And they're like, okay, that's not a good response. Well, in Mormonism, everything about being black makes me ugly, okay? They were saying that Michelle Obama was ugly and that she looked like a man. Mm -hmm. They were saying Kamala Harris is ugly. She looks like a monkey and a cheetah. They were saying Katanji uh, Jackson, the justice, she looks weird with her hair. Beyonce is a whore. Um, all of these derogatory things about black women Yet the white women that were actually doing these naughty things, they have a word to say. We know about certain people's wives, other presidents' wives, what they've done. I didn't bring that up. But, and then to say that black women are masculine and ugly and look like apes and look like men and to talk about Serena Williams. So then to just shred Meghan Markle compared to... Kate, y'all don't like black women. I don't care what you say because I'm seeing all of your Facebook is a different place than TikTok or Instagram. These are people that you both have chosen to add as friends. So and they're not hiding behind fake names. They're uh, using their real names. They are using their real names. Yeah. And they are just shredding Rihanna. They are shredding Katanji and mm. So they're, they're shredding me too. Not only are they shredding me by shredding these women, but they are actively saying things to me. And the, yeah, the point I'm making is that they're, they're not saying necessarily anything about blackness. They're hiding it in political, political oh, differences of or of course more general features. Sure. But it's kind of obvious that it's dripping with racism, just with the words kind of swapped out. It's well, kind I of that. Them. Oh yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. It's kind of the difference between like that covert versus overt yeah. racism. Yeah, it's covert. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and man, I even feel covert to you. What were you going to say? No, yeah. she's, she's right. And what I noticed is that the, I would say, you know what, I'm going to step back and not feel hurt. And I'm going to ask you, so what is it about, their policies. I'm not going to turn this to a political thing, but I'm, I would ask them, tell me about their policies because maybe I can understand where you're coming from. Crickets. I know a lot about politics. So I was like, I'm listening. I would like to hear about which policies that she's done, he's done, they've done that is so horrible that makes you think these things about them. Not a word. Yeah. Not a word. Yeah. So for a minute, can I go back to white women? Is that okay? Because I yes, really want to talk about I kind of yes. really want to, um, you know, so I've heard uh, a few things in you describing a couple of your relationships, right? I'm hearing kind of this idea of white women, a uh, heavy emphasis on like them idealizing themselves and, and kind of putting you in your place. Always. Right. And then I'm hearing a lot of times this idea of uh, your reality isn't real to them. It's kind of just their their reality that they kind of place over you and kind of try to try to tell you kind of how it should be. Um, and then this syrupy like kind of the context is that they're your friend. So they use kind of that trust in a way to control and hurt you. Am I getting that right? And am I missing key parts too? Because I think this is really important. 
And I, and just to give you a full chance to answer, add on top of that, kind of like a status where they're able to talk down to you in a way that maybe makes them feel superior, makes them feel better because they get to coach you yeah. and provide oh, you with direction. Like the help. They're being providing help. Or they're helping you. Absolutely. They're showing Service love to the or, person who uh, needs love. So you're almost reinforcing their ego, making them feel like they're great because they're helping lowly their Chanel identity. who needs help. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and, and some of them, I mean, there are some significant things that happen to my children, some, some horrible things that happen and, uh, not having support. Um, I've had some support for, for some of them and they would be like, um, you see, we don't have problems and people don't harm us and we are doing well financially because of how we live. The Lord blesses us because of how we live. You're obviously are not blessed. Mm. I mean, look what you do and where you live compared to us. You need to get it right. And when you get it right, he will bless you. I had one friend end a friendship with me when um, I was dating someone because she said she didn't like him. She didn't think he was doing enough and said, this is what she said to me and got really uh, mama hen. She said, um, you need to break up with him. And I was like, what? No. She's like, you need to break up with him. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. And you need to listen to me. And I said, no, I'm older than you. First of all, I got 15 years on you and uh, I think I'm doing okay. She's like, nope. Even though she's too has been married three times, but she knew better than me and that I needed to listen to her. And so I refused to listen to her. And so she hung up on me, stopped talking to me for a few days. And so I, I got upset. I unfriended her. I blocked her. And then she sent her husband to me. And I was like, wow, because I wouldn't take her calls. And so he kept trying to call me. I said, I want to talk. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. <sighs> so he comes over and force, tries to force me. She wants to talk to you. You need to talk to her. I go, I don't want to talk to her. He's like, you need to talk to her. And so I eventually talked to her. But And then the thing about it is I do not like that person I was. Do you know how many times I apologized to her? I didn't do anything except say I won't listen to you on this this relationship and she says i accept i still remember many times trying to make sure her and i were good and apologizing profusely and she's like okay i accept that okay but don't do it again okay mm. and i was like okay okay so another one she was upset because she told me to get off of tiktok this is also public the ones i'm talking about are public that you can see um, so that I'm not, you know, telling private things that happen between us. Um, she told me to get off TikTok and I said, no, I like TikTok. And she says, well, TikTok is being invaded by China and they're going to steal your, your data. You never listen to me. I always get it right. You always get it wrong. That's why your life sucks. You're not listening to me. And I said, I like TikTok. She goes, fine, stay asleep and never talk to me, ever talk to me again. Mm. So then I keep thinking about these relationships I have with these women. If they tell me to do something and I refuse, because before, remember, they could tell me what to do and I would listen. How can I be better? What can I do to, to be a good wife? What can I do to be a great example? You need to do this. You need to do this. How long, how many scriptures are you reading? Are you reading for an hour? Are you reading for 30 minutes? Uh, I read 30 minutes. You need to read an hour. Okay. What do I need to do? You need to not hang out with that friend. That friend is bad. Look at my friends. My girlfriends are wealthy. They have good husbands. They go on trips. You don't do any of that stuff. So those people are not good for you. Okay. Okay. I am good for you. I always look out for you. Don't I look out for you? Yes. Okay. Then you need to listen. Okay. You need to listen. You're not getting it. This is how most of them talk to me. Mm. And I told you the one that was telling me, I mean, my husband laugh about this because she was like, well, you're not going to be successful in this MLM unless you do what you're told. Mm. You need to listen to us. We know better. Mm. And wow. I mean, <laughs> just kind of conversations I had with her about black people and about poor people and what she thought about black and poor people mm. or people she considered poor. Mm -hmm. It was weird. Mm. I mean, I guess I'm noticing this contradiction of they're helping you sometimes they provide you with financial support Absolutely. or social support or friend friendship support or whatever is that like kind of white savior though yeah it's like I, I get to help you and so you need to be grateful 
But what comes with that is number one, I get to also act like I'm better than you and talk down to you. And then you exist to help me feel like I'm a great person because I'm giving charity to those who are unfortunate. And I get to give tips to somebody who needs to learn to live better, to live more like me. So you're kind of being kept in a lower place so that white Mormon women can feel better about themselves. I don't know how else to say it. You know, John, I don't I don't think people really understand how deep it gets with being in their presence. Sometimes it was like, I, oh, I need to hurt myself to make you feel better. Okay, watch this, watch this. Look, I punched myself in the face, laughing about it. Good, do it again, do it again. I'm a shuck and jive for you. What else do you need me to do? Aww. Yeah, black people are stupid, right? We're stupid. Yeah, you guys are stupid. Okay, what else are you going to do? Oh, let me call your kids some names. You know, they're little nigglets. And I'm like, uh, what? What? Wait, what? And then have to accept that because she was helping at a time when I was going through a divorce. What was I going to do? Mm. So let me just let me just keep hurting myself to make you feel good. Is, it, is that enough? Is that funny for you? Do, do, what else do I need to do to make sure you're not going to go anywhere? Mm. It, it's almost like prostituting yourself. You know, I know it's harmful, but I don't care. At that point, I am desperate. At that point, I am terrified. At that point, no matter how hard I am working, that's Red Robin. I busted my ass. I, they they noticed that. You know, I did, you know, I I wasn't late. I never was late. I don't care if it was snowing. I don't care if I was sick. It was important to me to not be late. If I had to be there at 10, I was there at 9.30. Like with us, you're yeah. always you I, always I, beat us here at Mormon Story I, Studios. I don't want to be late because somebody that's somebody else's time that rather you agree to it or they ask you to, you don't waste people's time, mm. especially a business. So I wasn't going to be late, but you also don't want to fulfill the negative stereotype. That oh, that too. Oh you, gosh, right? no. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. I I worked. I you know black people are lazy. They always want a handout. No, I busted my ass, and it still wasn't enough. Mm. It still wasn't enough going to school, trying to go to school, trying to raise kids, trying to do all this. It's not enough. It's deficient. So I can never see my kids and have daycare, which was taking, you know, the state help with part of that, but I still had to pay my part. So I'm supposed to manage a car payment, supposed to manage insurance, manage my household and manage daycare, daycare for two kids. Even back then that was more than my rent car and insurance, but I had to work. And just, uh, you need to get a better job. Okay. So if I get a better job, this is what the job requires that I don't miss work. I have children. I will miss work. I have babies that are 15 months apart. I will miss work. The restaurant is flexible because if I call in, they can implement another server or they can give somebody to cover other jobs. It's not like that. And they will fire you. Yeah. It reminds me too, when you're talking of using, it's actually privilege their lives. A lot of, um, well, I'll just speak for myself. (laughs) Like a lot of the lives that we enjoy are, uh, are, you know, privilege, privilege that we have, but they're using it like it's virtue, like it's goodness. And then using that as sort of like in a violent, aggressive way, against you like just do this see how virtuous i am see how you know um good i am and that's why my life looks like this and your life over there because you're when in fact it's it's actually privilege right that they have those things as opposed to so it's like weaponizing it's it's weaponizing their privilege and calling it something else with you i mean always and it's then it starts to well you're we don't like the way you're dressing because, you know, you showed shoulder and well, I don't want you around my husband. I think what you're doing for uh, a career is disgusting. You know, you want to give massages. You went to massage school. That is gross. Oh. And it's just like, yeah. why is that gross? Because you have a misconception about massage. You make it, you're making it something that it's not. Um, just, just different things like, well, I don't want you to come around our family, not because you're a bad person, but I just think, I just think the way that you are and the way that you dress is just so inappropriate. You know, it's just so weird. And so that would probably be best. Now I love you. And I'm saying this with love, 
but there's just something really wicked about you. Mm. Got it. You know, it's just. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'm so sorry. Really, I'm really so, so sorry. Hmm. Just weird. <laughs> and if you went back to these, let's just say white Mormon women to try and have this conversation, I imagine what they would think in their minds is, but we helped her. We, we helped her so many times. That's what they keep saying. How ungrateful. A like, absolutely. I brought her food. I helped her kids. We gave her money. How could she be so, all, no good deed goes unpunished. No matter how much we tried to help her, she had to talk bad about us. Like She's very ungrateful. Um, I get that a lot. Yeah. And that's, I mean, can it be both? Can it be that they did help you, but also there's a bigger problem? that needs to be addressed and we should be able to talk about it. And maybe they harmed you too. And maybe there was some self-interest woven into the times that they helped you that also. A lot you know, of guilt. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can tell that they had a lot of guilt. And what, what, what you notice, if you ever had mean girls or mean people and you walk into a room and you notice the room gets really weird and silent when you walk in, they're like, Hey, how are you doing? I'm like, okay, something's off here. Same thing is that you know that they have thoughts about you, and some are so bold. They like to tell you, yeah, I think you suck. Yeah, I think your life is terrible. Yeah, I think you're evil. That doesn't mean I don't love you. That doesn't mean I'm not saying this without love. They keep saying this, but I still love you. You're evil. You're terrible. You're cursed. You're Mark. You're deplorable, but I still love you. And uh, love this Love the sinner, hate the sin. I will always love you, no matter how evil and wicked and terrible you are. I'm still going to love you. But I'm not going to be nice to you. And I'm not going to have you over anymore. I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to uh, be passive aggressive and say things to you. I'm going to make, I'm not going to interact with anything you say great that's happening in your life. But when you say something I don't like, I'm going to come up and say something mean to you because I love you. <laughs> that is my relationship with these women. Mm. it's but the, the other thing is i just talked to a woman yesterday who's been my friend for 22 years i work with her at red robin she's white she's not mormon what did she do she's extremely busy she's wealthy she her and her husband have a wonderful company that they participate in and what did she do she marco pulled me and said, hey, I got some time. And she, the way she looked at me was like, she was like, she goes, tell me what you're doing. Because I know you're going crazy right now with all the Hallmark Christmas movies. Tell me what you're doing. That's, how hard is that? How hard is that for these other women to do that? She sees what I post sometimes. She doesn't always agree with what I post. She doesn't always agree with what, what who or what I'm about. But this is how she was. She's like, oh, my gosh, you know, I know that your 13 trees are about to get decorated. I know this. Oh, my gosh. And then you, your grandson had his birthday, blah, 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 blah. That was a conversation. How hard is that? She sees you. She yes. sees me. She sees me. Mm -hmm. She's my cheerleader. It's not that hard. Right. And back to your comment, just one idea I have about when you were bringing out um, well, did like it sounds like the white women helped you some and then hurt you some, and but it can maybe it's both. Maybe they did actually help you. I just always fall back to that alok, and now like that alok statement about a use versus care, and I think sometimes the the you know it gets real real messy there. But what I'm hearing anyway from Chanel is this idea of feeling so used by white women feeling so much commentary as like, that's what I'm hearing, uh, having white women feel like they can truly comment um, from the white kind of reality point of view in a way that's using, it, it's, it's not care. Because what I'm hearing is you don't feel seen. Your reality isn't seen. You're not heard. You're not actually, you know, valued in that way. And so for me, it feels abusive. It feels abusive to give in one moment 
uh, here's money or here's something you need that we see that systemically you, you don't get to have because you don't have the privilege we have. So here, enjoy that. But it, the cost to you is that I actually view you as less than me. And I'm going to remind you of that. And anytime you share voice or spirit with me, I'm going to put you back where you belong. That to me is abusive. Um, much like another abusive relationship where sometimes you get flowers or chocolates after you're beaten. Um, to me, it's not that different. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing something that clearly has been really painful for you in your life. Yeah, I am. Um Not an easy thing to hear because it's true because you think about these women that you try everything you can to see them for who they are, their mistakes and all, but they refuse to do that for you. Why is that so hard? And a woman on TikTok said, um, fear. She said, yeah, we're, we're afraid of you guys, but it's not for the reason that you think. And uh, why would you kick, I, I hate this analogy, but I don't know any other way to help people understand. Why would you kick a dog that keeps licking you, loves you, lets you pet him, um, and you kick it, and it keeps coming back, and you kick it, and you feed it, and then you kick it, and then it comes back again because it thinks and believes while well, you feed it, you must love it. And when I think about these women, I am not their equal, and they've explained that. I couldn't be their equal because they are motivated by material things. They're motivated by material things, and they're like, you don't have these things. So you are not the same as us. And the reason why I were able to treat you like this is because you deserve it because you don't say nice things. You say things we don't like. What do you think is going to happen? Meaning you criticize the church. that they Correct. Mm. That's what you get. That's what you deserve. But even before that, what about when I was active? What is their reasoning then? It's a treadmill. They just keep you on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. You're always hustling to be good enough. No matter where you are, you're never good enough, and you always have to keep hustling. But even trying to move forward a little bit, that's not right. I mean, what kind of mother leaves her kids and goes and do, does that? You need a husband. Stay there. But consistently telling me a place I belong and putting me there. No, we're going to grab you and put you right back there. You stay right there. Do as you're told. Thank you so much. It shouldn't be your job to educate us, but thank you so much for being willing to help us understand your experience and how we all need to learn and do better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So this second marriage lasted... About Over 60. a decade. Oh, yeah. You had two kids with this man. Mm -hmm. He never joined the church. No. And mm -hmm. when that marriage ended, how was that? So that was how many years ago? I divorced him 2014. Okay. So we're talking we're talking eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And what was, what was your relationship with the church at that point? And was there any fallout with the church for that second divorce? And... At the point with that marriage ended, were you still active and faithful? I was still active and faithful. Okay. And was there fallout from that? Were there disciplinary councils in that thing? No, not at all. Okay. That was, <clears throat> that was a, a fair time. Like, I didn't mind going to church. The ward I was in seemed, they seemed to do it differently than other people. And what I mean by that is the bishop at the time tried he tried with as much understanding as he can possibly give to include my family and I. He really did. He really 
meant well. With that, he couldn't possibly know, or maybe he didn't know, of other people's thoughts, though, and and what they thought. Um, a Relief Society president, she she meant well, too. All of these people meant well and did well until, and we'll just leave it at that until we get to that point, every one of them seemed to do to do good until. Okay. So the year that things really started to tank with the church was was what year? 2016. Okay. And your second marriage ended again what year? 2014. Okay. So so those two years you're back a single mom again and now you've got four kids as a single mom still in the church. Anything you want to say about that bef- before we kind of end this episode? And I guess the th- part three will be when er- when, it- when the Mormon, when your Mormon kind of dream slash nightmare yeah. falls apart completely. Anything else about your life you want to share those final two years as a single mom again? Was that hard to be? At what age were you a single mom again with four kids now? See, I'm 50 now. That was uh, eight years ago, so 42, 42. in my 40s. What was it like being a single Mormon black mom in Utah at 42? (laughs) Any better than at at the younger age? Yes. Worse? Here's the thing. The reason, like, I'm trying to think, why was I so active at that point? I was sick. I was extremely sick, like very ill, meaning I had a doctor say, all right, we got to do something or you're going to die. Like mm. you are not doing well. Your, your high blood pressure. I mean, I was in the ER like every other week with nosebleeds, mm, passing out, wow. uh, blood pressure like two two sixteen over one eighty. I mean, oh. it was things were bad. Like I was not doing well, and they were helping a lot. Like, hey, do you need somebody to bring dinner? Um, and I knew that as long as I went to church, if something happened to me, somebody could grab my kids. So. I didn't go to church because I believed I went to church to survive. Mm. So if I go to church and I pass out right here, at least there's a bunch of people around. I'm home alone. I'm home alone with four children. If I pass out and die in front of my kids, that's not going to go well. So at least if I'm at church, God's not going to let me go in front of the church, right? Like I'm going to church. I'm doing the right thing. So all of these health issues are not going to happen at church. So I'm going to go. And I was early. So when the ward, when the church started at 830, I was there at 8. Front row, ready to go. I'm not dying at church. I know that. Hmm. Nothing happened at church. Wow. And, I, and I don't want to say that the Mormonism was the cause of your illnesses, but I just can't imagine f- several decades of living under this, what I would say is a culturally oppressive slash, to abusive. your point, Margie, abusive system how that couldn't impact your physical health. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then to me, it's another example of the church causing an illness that then they offer themselves as the cure for. Sure. Like, I don't think they'll ever get it unless I explain it and talk about it. And in a room full of a hundred people, maybe only three will get it and the rest don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But of course it did because what am I doing now? I am questioning heavily This is my second marriage. I'm questioning God. I'm questioning me. I'm questioning them. I need answers to know how to maneuver. So I am trying to work. I'm now worried about four children instead of Mm. two. Um, Things are not good. And I'm trying to trust these people around me to, to get answers on how to live, what to do. And... Uh, the people I'm hanging around are saying racist things on holidays, you know, or really, you know, remember uh, the Obamas were depressed, you know, the couple at that time. So I was consistently hearing, we're not talking about their policies. We're hearing things. I mean, we had this one kid and we laugh about it now because we don't know how else to take it, but he came to the table, we're eating and he says, Oh, yeah, he says some really derogatory things about President Obama. And I said, do you know what you just said? 
do you know how, how racist that is? He goes, no, my mom says that. And I said, you can't say that. He's like, why? And we all educated him. Like my kids were getting mad. My one is feisty. And she was like, I'm going to hit him. I'm like, don't you dare. And you comfortable sharing what he said. Yeah. He said that he said that Obama was a porch monkey. And I was like, porch monkey. I haven't heard that in years. And I said, do you, he was 17. And oh, it's I a, it's a Mormon kid. Yeah. And I said, do you know what that is? He's like, yeah, he is a porch monkey and blah, 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 blah. And, he, and I was like, no, 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 Listen, listen, listen. You cannot say that. And he called my daughter inward and they did get in a physical altercation. But I told him, I said, sweetheart, do you understand how bad that is? He's like, why? My mom says this. And I was like, uh, I'm gonna have some words with your mom. And we, we sat there and he was crying and we were upset. And, and I said, honey, you can't say that. You're saying it around me, a person who loves you. You're going to say that around a black person that doesn't love you and they are going to hurt you. That brings out some very, very intense emotions. Maybe they won't physically hurt you. Maybe verbally they will. But I'm going to tell you, they're not going to like that. Those are some very harmful things. And he was like, sorry. And <laughs> you said your kids were teaching him too. A w one Unfortunately, they were teaching each other and they got in a physical altercation. Oh, okay. yeah, that was yeah. not fun because he was screaming, N-word, N-word, and she didn't take that well. <laughs> we were like, no, they were fighting. And we, we, we talk about that now because it was, it was just so weird to see a girl fighting a boy because he said the N-word to her and he was screaming it at her. Mm. So. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you're you're kind of having a physical breakdown during those years of being single, post second divorce. Anything else you want to share before we kind of end part two and and then come back for part three about kind of your leaving the Mormon Church? I just wonder what it would have looked like had they just been like, "We got you, no strings attached." Like, you don't have to take this when you tell us you this is not comfortable or this is wrong or this is actually a racist thing that we say, hey, we're sorry we got it wrong. Let's figure out what we can do. Let's pray about it. Let's have a blessing or something to know that these things that we're saying about black people are not okay. I mean, I'll say one last thing, but for example... My children obviously have different skin tones. That is for many reasons. Oh, you were talking about because you married a white man, your mm -hmm. third and fourth children Are had treated lighter different. skin. Yeah. They had a way lighter skin, different texture hair, different facial features. And so one day I did walk in and there was four kids with me. So even just being fully black, you're going to have different skin tones. My, my ex-husband was darker than me. Uh, one of my children is darker and one of them is lighter, lighter than me. They have the same dad. So then my two with a white man, one is very, very white passing. You, you wouldn't know she was black. They tell her she's not black. And then my son looks more, they say he looks more Polynesian. Um, he has a darker skin tone. So I walk in with four kids, little babies, you know, they're kids. And I kid you not. A woman comes up to me. This is before church is starting. It's like, you know, you're starting to find the pew where you're going to sit. And she says, oh, my gosh, do all your kids have the same dad? And I go, what? She's like, well, there's four and they're all different skins. Oh, my gosh. Do they all have the same dad? I was not nice. I said, ask your husband. And I walked away and I went and sat down. I was really angry. I was very offended. Um, that was just not a good question. Mm. That, like, who cares? Like, what if they did? What if each one of them, what if all four of my children each had a different dad? Who cares? Why does it matter? I didn't ask her any questions about her life. Yeah, I was not nice. Mm. And on the one hand, I guess all over the world, people are going to say and do racist things. This is the church that claims to be led by God. Exactly. This is the church that claims to be led by Jesus. This is the church with hundreds of billions of dollars and the church that claims to love black people and that could educate 5 million members in a weekend mm -hmm. and make it all better. And so I guess 
where much is given, kind of much is expected, the church in a weekend could could solve that problem. Absolutely. But they but they don't. They say, you know, they'll say whatever PR things they can say to avoid an actual apology. And then to say, look, we donated a couple million dollars to the NCAA, P, NAACP. We're not racist. Those those things that were said in the past, that's folklore. That's not, they could fix it, but they don't. They put lipstick on, you know, something. They could fix it. Yeah. General Conference, they can fix it. Yeah. But they know what they've created won't accept that. That will not go well. Because mm-hmm. there's too many racist members. Absolutely. That would leave the church <coughs> or question the, you know, the inspiration of the leaders if they recanted, if they explicitly denounced and apologized for their racist past, they would lose too many of the racist members they themselves created from the church. Yep. Is that unfair? That is absolutely fair. And their tithing dollars. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And these days the church can't afford to be losing anybody because they're losing people in droves anyway. Oh, yeah. This would just, the exodus, the, I don't think they could withstand that. It will crumble and different sects will start. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's super hard. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess, should we say that's part two of our interview yep. with Chanel Eckenbach? <coughs> and uh, we're going to grab lunch and then we'll come right back. Yeah. Either later today or another time. And we're going to do part three, sure. which is how the, the Mormon dream, and I say that Chanel's Mormon dream, how it, uh, how it fell apart. Yeah. And, maybe, right? a, and maybe with a touch hard. of reconstruction. Yes. With a heavy dose of reconstruction. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you strike me as a happy, healthy person. So, <clears throat> so you've done yeah. some healing and growing. So when you have a disease and you took the medication and you no longer have that disease, you're going to feel better. Mm. That's the best way I can describe it. Ooh. Stay tuned Beautiful. for part three. Yeah. Do not go away. Come right back because part three is going to be good. Chanel, none of us probably understand how courageous and resilient um, it is for you to be telling these stories today. And you mm. you tell these stories so gracefully. Mm. You're just so used to mm. being strong and resilient. But I know this isn't fun, easy stuff to talk about. Right. So thank you. You're welcome. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Margie. Yeah. You're brilliant, as always. Yeah, I'm Grateful to be here. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Come right back for part three of our interview with Chanel Achenbach about her Mormon story. Take care. See you on the flip side.